Chapter 11. Grover gets a Lamborghini. We were crossing the Potomac when we spotted the helicopter. It was a sleek black military model, just like the one we'd seen at Westover Hall, and it was coming straight towards us. They know the van, I said. We have to ditch it. Zoe swerved into the fast lane. The helicopter was gaining. Maybe the military will shoot it down, Grover said hopefully. The military probably thinks it's one of theirs, I said. How can the general use mortals anyway? Mercenaries, Zoe said bitterly. It is distasteful, but many mortals will fight for any cause as long as they are paid. But don't these mortals see who they're working for? I asked. Don't they notice all the monsters around them? Zoe shook her head. I do not know how much they see through the mist. I doubt it would matter to them if they knew the truth. Sometimes mortals can be more horrible than monsters. The helicopter kept coming, making a lot better time than we were through DC traffic. Thalia closed her eyes and prayed hard. Hey, Dad, a lightning bolt would be nice about now, please. But the sky stayed grey and snowy, no sign of a helpful thunderstorm. There, Bianca said, that parking lot. We'll be trapped, Zoe said. Trust me, Bianca said. Zoe shot across two lanes of traffic and into a mild parking lot on the south bank of the river. We left the van and followed Bianca down some steps. Subway entrance, Bianca said. Let's go south. Alexandria. Anything, Thalia agreed. We bought tickets and got through the turnstiles, looking behind us for any signs of pursuit. A few minutes later, we were safely aboard a southbound train, riding away from DC. As our train came above ground, we could see the helicopter circling the parking lot, but it didn't come after us. Grover let out a sigh. Nice job, Bianca. Thinking of the subway. Bianca looked pleased. Yeah, well, I remembered that station from when Nico and I came through last summer. I was really surprised to see it because it wasn't here when we used to live in DC. Grover frowned. New, but that station looked really old. I guess, Bianca said, but trust me, when we lived here as little kids, there was no subway. Thalia sat forward. Wait a minute. No subway at all? Bianca nodded. Now, I knew nothing about DC, but I didn't see how their whole subway system could be less than 12 years old. I guess everyone else was thinking the same thing, because they looked pretty confused. Bianca, Zoe said. How long ago? Her voice faltered. The sound of the helicopter was getting louder again. We need to change trains, I said. Next station. Over the next half hour, all we thought about was getting away safely. We changed trains twice. I had no idea where we were going, but after a while we lost the helicopter. Unfortunately, when we finally got off the train, we found ourselves at the end of the line, in an, in an, an industrial area, with nothing but warehouses and railway tracks. And snow. Lots of snow. It seemed much colder here. I was glad of my new lion fur coat. We wandered through the railway yard, thinking there might be another passenger train somewhere, but there were just rows and rows of freight cars, most of which were covered in snow, like they hadn't moved in years. A homeless guy was standing at a trash can fire. We must have looked pretty pathetic because he gave us a toothless grin and said, Y'all need to get warmed up. Come on over. We huddled around his fire. Thalia's teeth were chattering. She said, Well, this is g g g great. My hooves are frozen, Grover complained. Feet, I corrected, for the sake of the homeless guy. Maybe we should contact camp, Bianca said. Chiron, no, Zoe said. They cannot help us any more. We must finish this quest ourselves. I gazed miserably around the railway yard. Somewhere far to the west, Annabeth was in danger. Artemis was in chains. A doomsday monster was on the loose. And we were stuck on the outskirts of DC, sharing a homeless person's fire. You know, the homeless man said, you're never completely without friends. His face was grimy and his beard tangled, but his expression seemed kindly. You kids need a train going west? Yes, sir, I said. You know of any? He pointed one greasy hand. Suddenly, I noticed a freight train gleaming and free of snow. It was one of those automobile carrier trains with steel mesh curtains and a triple deck of cars inside. The side of the freight train said, Sun West Line. That's convenient, Thalia said. Thanks, uh... She turned to the homeless guy, but he was gone. The trash can in front of us was cold and empty, as if he'd taken the flames with him. An hour later, we were rumbling west. There was no problem about who would drive now, because we all got our own luxury car. Zoe and Bianca were crashed out in a Lexus on the top deck. Grover was playing race car driver behind the wheel of a Lamborghini. And Thalia had hot-wired the radio in a black Mercedes SLK, so she could pick up the alt-rock stations from DC. Join you? I asked her. She shrugged, so I climbed into the shotgun seat. The radio was playing the white stripes. 
I knew the song because it was one, because it was one of the only CDs I owned that my mum liked. She said it reminded her of Led Zeppelin. Thinking about my mum made me sad because it didn't seem likely I'd be home for Christmas. I might not live that long. Nice coat, Falia told me. I pulled it round me, thankful for the warmth. Yeah, but the Nemean lion wasn't the monster we're looking for. Not even close. We've got a long way to go. Whatever this mystery monster is, the general said it would come for you. They wanted to isolate you from the group, so the monster will appear and battle you one-on-one. -on -one. He said that. Well, something like that, yeah. That's great. I love being used as bait. No idea what the monster might be? She shook her head morosely. But you know where we're going, don't you? San Francisco. That's where Artemis was heading. I remembered something Annabeth had said at the dance, how her dad was moving to San Francisco, and there was no way he could go, she could go. Half-bloods couldn't live there. Why? I asked. What's so bad about San Francisco? The mist is really thick there because the mountain of despair is so near. Titan magic. What's left of it still lingers. Monsters are attracted to that area like you wouldn't believe. What's the mountain of despair? Thalia raised an eyebrow. You really don't know? Ask stupid Zoe. She's the expert. She glared out the windshield. I wanted to ask her what she was talking about, but I also didn't want to sound like an idiot. I hated feeling like Thalia knew more than I did, so I kept my mouth shut. The afternoon sun shone through the steel mesh side of the freight car, casting a shadow across Thalia's face. I thought about how different she was from Zoe. Zoe, all formal and aloof like a princess. Thalia, with her ratty clothes and her rebel attitude. But there was something similar about them too. The same kind of toughness. Right now, sitting in the shadows with a gloomy expression, Thalia looked a lot like one of the hunters. Then suddenly it hit me. That's why you don't get along with Zoe. Thalia frowned. What? The hunters tried to recruit you? I guessed. Her eyes got dangerously bright. I thought she was going to zap me out of the Mercedes, but she just sighed. I almost joined them, she admitted. Luke, Annabeth and I ran into them once, and Zoe tried to convince me. She almost did, but... But... Thalia's fingers gripped the wheel. I would have had to leave Luke. Oh... Zoe and I got into a fight. She told me I was being stupid. She said I'd regret my choice. She said Luke would let me down someday. I watched the sun through the metal curtain. We seemed to be travelling faster each second. Shadows flickering, like an old movie projector. That's harsh, I said. Hard to admit Zoe was right. She wasn't right. Luke never let me down. Never. We'll have to fight him, I said. There's no way around it. Thalia didn't answer. You haven't seen him lately, I warned. I know it's hard to believe, but... I'll do what I have to do, even if that means killing him. Do me a favour, she said. Get out of my car. I felt so bad for her, I didn't argue. As I was about to leave, she said, Percy. When I looked back, her eyes were red, but I couldn't tell if it was anger or sadness. Annabeth wanted to join the hunters too. Maybe you should think about why. Before I could respond, she raised the power windows and shut me out. I sat in the driver's seat of Grover's Lamborghini. Grover was asleep in the back. He'd finally given up trying to impress Zoe and Bianca with his pipe music after he played Poison Ivy and caused that very put stuff to sprout from their Lexus air conditioner. As I watched the sun go down, I thought of Annabeth. I was afraid to go to sleep. I was worried what I might dream. Oh, don't be afraid of dreams, a voice said right next to me. I looked over. Somehow, I wasn't surprised to find the homeless guy from the railway yard sitting in the shotgun seat. His jeans were so worn out, they were almost white. His coat was ripped, with stuffing coming out. He looked kind of like a teddy bear that had been run over by a truck. If it weren't for dreams, he said, I wouldn't know half the things I know about the future. They're better than Olympus tabloids. He cleared his throat and then held up his hands dramatically. Dreams like a podcast, downloading truth in my ears. They tell me cool stuff. Apollo, I guessed, because I figured nobody else could make a haiku that bad. He put his finger to his lips. I'm incognito. Call me Fred. A god named Fred. Ah, oh, well, Zeus insists on certain rules. Hands off when there's a human quest, even when something really major is going. Well, when it's going wrong. But nobody messes with my baby sister. Nobody. Can you help us then? Shh, I already have. Haven't you been looking outside? The train. How fast are we moving? Apollo chuckled. Fast enough. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. It's almost sunset. But I imagine we'll get you across a good chunk of America at least. But where is Artemis? His face darkened. I know a lot, and I see a lot, but even I don't know that. She's clouded from me. I don't like it. And Annabeth? He frowned. Oh, you mean that girl you lost? Hmm. I don't know. I tried not to feel mad. 
I knew the gods had a hard time taking mortals seriously, even half-bloods. We live such short lives compared to the gods. What about the monster Artemis was seeking, I asked. Do you know what it is? No, Apollo said, but there is one who might. If you haven't yet found the monster when you reach San Francisco, seek out Nereus, the old man of the sea. He has a long memory and a sharp eye. He has the gift of knowledge sometimes kept obscure from my oracle. But it's your oracle, I protested. Can't you tell us what the prophecy means? Apollo sighed. You might as well ask an artist to explain his art, or ask a poet to explain his poem. It defeats the purpose. The meaning is only clear through the search. In other words, you don't know. Apollo checked his watch. Ah, look at the time. I have to run. I doubt I can risk helping you again, Percy, but remember what I said. Get some sleep, and when you return, I expect a good haiku about your journey. I wanted to protest that I wasn't tired and I'd never make up a haiku in my life, but Apollo snapped his fingers and the next thing I knew, I was closing my eyes. In my dream, I was somebody else. I was wearing an old-fashioned Greek tunic, which was a little too breezy downstairs, and laced leather sandals. The Nemean lion's skin was wrapped around my back like a cape, and I was running somewhere, being pulled along by a girl who was gripping my hand tightly. Hurry, she said. It was too dark to see her face clearly, but I could hear the fear in her voice. He will find us. It was night time. A million stars blazed above. We were running through tall grass, and the scent of a thousand different flowers made the air intoxicating. It was a beautiful garden, and yet the girl was leading me through it as if we were about to die. I'm not afraid, I tried to tell her. You should be, she said, pulling me along. She had long, dark hair braided down her back. Her silk robes glowed faintly in the starlight. We raced up the side of the hill. She pulled me behind a thorn bush, and we collapsed, both breathing heavily. I didn't know why the girl was scared. The garden seemed so peaceful, and I felt strong, stronger than I'd ever felt before. There is no need to run, I told her. My voice sounded deeper, much more confident. I have bested a thousand monsters with my bare hands. Not this one, the girl said. Ladon is too strong. You must go round, up the mountain to my father. It is the only way. The hurt in her voice surprised me. She was really concerned, almost like she cared about me. I don't trust your father, I said. You should not, the girl agreed. You will have to trick him, but you cannot take the prize directly. You will die. I chuckled. Then why don't you help me, pretty one? I, I'm afraid. Ladon will stop me. My sisters, if they find out, they would disown me. Then there's nothing for it, I stood up, rubbing my hands together. Wait, the girl said. She seemed to be agonising over a decision, and then her fingers trembling, she reached up and plucked a long white brooch from her hair. If you must fight, take this. My mother, Pleone, gave it to me. She was a daughter of the ocean, and the ocean's power is within it. My immortal power. The girl breathed on the pin, and it glowed faintly. It gleamed in the starlight, like polished abalone. Take it, she told me, and make of it a weapon. I laughed. A hairpin? How will this slay Ladon? Pretty one. It may not, she admitted, but it is all I can offer, if you insist on being stubborn. The girl's voice softened my heart. I reached down and took the hairpin, and as I did, it grew longer and heavier in my hand, until I held a familiar bronze sword. Well balanced, I said, though I usually prefer to use my bare hands. What shall I name this blade? Anaclismos, the girl said sadly, the current that takes one by surprise, and before you know it, you have been swept out to sea. Before I could thank her, there was a trembling and trampling sound in the grass, a hiss like air escaping a tyre, and the girl said, Too late, he is here. I sat bolt upright in the Lamborghini's driver's seat. Grover was shaking my arm. Percy, he said, it's morning. The train stopped. Come on. I tried to shake off my drowsiness. Thalia, Zoe and Bianca had already rolled up the metal curtains. Outside were snowy mountains dotted with pine trees, the sun rising red between two peaks. I fished my pen out of my pocket and stared at it. Anaclusmos, the ancient Greek name for Riptide. A different form, but I was sure it was the same blade I'd seen in my dream. And I was sure of something else, too. The girl I had seen was Nut Zoe Nightshade. Chapter 12. I go snowboarding with a pig. We'd arrived on the outskirts of a little ski town nestled in the mountains. The sign said, Welcome to Cloudcroft, New Mexico. The air was cold and thin, the roofs of the cabins were heaped with snow, and dirty mounds of it were piled up on the sides of the streets. Tall pine trees loomed over the valley, casting pitch-black shadows through the morning, though the morning was sunny. 
Even with my lion skin coat, I was freezing by the time we got to Main Street, which was about half a mile from the train tracks. As we walked, I told Grover about, about my conversation with Apollo the night before, how he'd told me to seek out Nereus in San Francisco. Grover looked uneasy. That's good, I guess, but we've got to get there first. I tried not to get too depressed about our chances. I didn't want to send Grover into a panic, but I knew we had another huge deadline looming, aside from saving Artemis in time for her Council of the Gods. The general had said Annabeth would only be kept alive until the winter solstice. That was Friday, only four days away, and he'd said something about a sacrifice. I didn't like the sound of that at all. We stopped in the middle of town. You could pretty much see everything from there. A school, a bunch of tourist stores and cafes, some ski cabins and a grocery store. Great, Falia said, looking around. No bus station, no taxis, no car rental, no way out. There's a coffee shop, said Grover. Yes, so he said. Coffee is good. And pastries, Grover said dreamily. And wax paper. Falia sighed. Fine. How about you two go get us some food? Percy, Bianca and I will check in the grocery store. Maybe they can give us directions. We agreed to meet back in front of the grocery store in 15 minutes. Bianca looked a little uncomfortable coming with us, but she did. Inside the store, we found out a few found out a few valuable things about Cloudcroft. There wasn't enough snow for skiing. The grocery store sold rubber hats for a dollar each, and there was no way, easy way, in or out of the town unless you had your own car. You could call for a taxi from Alamogordo, the clerk said doubtfully. That's down at the bottom of the mountains, but it wouldn't. It would take at least an hour to get there. Cost several hundred dollars. The clerk looked so lonely. I bought a rubber hat, and then we headed back outside and stood on the porch. Wonderful, Falia grumped. I'm going to walk down the street, see if anybody in the other shops has a suggestion. But the clerk said, I know, she told me. I'm checking anyway. I let her go. I knew how it felt to be restless. All half-bloods had attention deficit problems because of our inborn battlefield, battlefield reflexes. We couldn't stand just waiting around. Also, I had a feeling Falia was still upset over our conversation last night about Luke. Bianca and I stood together awkwardly. I mean, I was never very comfortable talking one-on-one -on -one with girls anyway, and I'd never been alone with Bianca before. I wasn't sure what to say, especially now that she was a hunter and everything. Nice rat, she said at last. I set it on the porch railing. Maybe it would attract more business for the store. So, how do you like being a hunter so far, I asked. She pursed her lips. You're not still mad at me for joining, are you? Nah, long as you know. You're happy. I'm not sure happy is the right word, with Lady Artemis gone. But being a hunter is definitely cool. I feel calmer somehow. Everything seems to have slowed down around me. I guess that's the immortality. I stared at her, trying to see the difference. She did seem more confident than before, more at peace. She didn't hide her face under a green cap anymore. She kept her hair tied back, and she looked me right in the eyes when she spoke. With a shiver, I realised that 500 or 1,000 or a 1,000 years from now, Bianca D'Angelo would look exactly the same as she did today. She might be having a conversation like this with some other half-blood long after I was dead, but Bianca would still look 12 years old. Nico didn't understand my decision, Bianca murmured. She looked at me like she wanted assurance it was okay. He'll be all right, I said. Camp Half-Blood takes in a lot of young kids. They did that for Annabeth. Bianca nodded. I hope we find her. Annabeth, I mean. She's lucky to have a friend like you. A lot of good it did her. Don't blame yourself, Percy. You risked your life to save my brother and me. I mean, that was seriously brave. If I hadn't met you, I wouldn't have felt okay about leaving Nico at the camp. I figured if there were people like you there, Nico would be fine. You're a good guy. The compliment took me by surprise. Even though I knocked you down in Capture the Flag. She laughed. Okay, except for that, you're a good guy. 200 metres away, Grover and Zoe came out of the coffee shop, loaded down with pastry bags and drinks. I kind of didn't want them to come back yet. It was weird, but I realised I liked talking to Bianca. She wasn't so bad. A lot easier to hang out with than Zoe Nightshade, anyway. So, what's the story with you and Nico? I asked her. Where did you go to school before Westover? She frowned. I think it was a boarding school in DC. It seems like so long ago. You never lived with your parents. I mean, your mortal parent. We were told our parents were dead. There was a bank trust for us. A lot of money, I think. A lawyer would come by once in a while to check on us. And then Nico and I had to leave that school. Why? She knitted her eyebrows. We had to go somewhere. I remember it was important. We travelled a long way. And we stayed in this hotel for a few weeks. And then, I don't know. One day a different lawyer came to get us out. He said it was time for us to leave. He drove us back east through DC, then up to Maine. 
and we started going to Westover. It was a strange story. Then again, Bianca and Nico were half-bloods. Nothing would be normal for them. So, you've been raising Nico pretty much all your life, I asked. Just the two of you. She nodded. That's why I wanted to join the Hunters so badly. I mean, I know it's selfish, but I wanted my own life and friends. I love Nico. Don't get me wrong. I just needed to find out what it would be like not to be a big sister 24 hours a day. I thought about last summer, the way I'd felt when I found out I had a cyclops for a baby brother. I could relate to what Bianca was saying. Zoe seems to trust you, I said. What were you guys talking about anyway? Something dangerous about the quest? When? Yesterday morning on the pavilion, I said, before I could stop myself. Something about the general. Her face darkened. How did you... The invisibility hat. Were you eavesdropping? No, I mean, not really. I, I just... I was saved from trying to explain when Zoe and Grover arrived with the drinks and pastries. Hot chocolate for Bianca and me. Coffee for them. I got a blueberry muffin and it was so good I could almost ignore the outraged look Bianca was giving me. We should do the tracking spell, Zoe said. Grover, do you have any acorns left? Um, Grover mumbled. He was chewing on a brown muffin, wrapper and all. I think so. I just need to... He froze. I was about to ask what was wrong when a warm breeze rustled past, like a gust of springtime that had got lost in the middle of winter. Fresh air seasoned with wildflowers and sunshine and something else, almost like a voice trying to say something, a warning. Zoe gasped, Grover, thy cup. Grover dropped his coffee cup, which was decorated with pictures of birds. Suddenly the birds peeled off the cup and flew away, a tiny flock of doves. My rubber rat squeaked. It scampered off the railing and into the trees, real fur, real whiskers. Grover collapsed next to his coffee, which steamed against the snow. We gathered around him and tried to wake him up. He groaned, his eyes fluttering. Hey, Thalia said, running up from the street. I just... What's wrong with Grover? I don't know, I said. He collapsed. Oh, Grover groaned. Well, get him up, Thalia said. She had her spear in her hand. She looked behind her as if she were being followed. We have to get out of here. We made it to the edge of the town before the first two skeleton warriors appeared. They stepped from the trees on either side of the road. Instead of grey camouflage, they were now wearing blue New Mexico State Police uniforms. But they had the same transparent grey skin and yellow eyes. They drew their handguns. I'll admit I used to think it would be kind of cool to learn how to shoot a gun, but I changed my mind as soon as the skeleton warriors pointed theirs at me. Thalia tapped her bracelet. Aegis spiralled to life on her arm, but the warriors didn't flinch. Their glowing yellow eyes bored right into me. I drew Riptide, though I wasn't sure what good it would do against guns. Zoe and Bianca drew their bows, but Bianca was having trouble because Grover kept swooning and leaning against her. Back up, Thalia said. We started to. But then I heard a rustling of branches. Two more skeletons appeared on the road behind us. We were surrounded. I wondered where the other skeletons were. I'd seen a dozen at the Smithsonian. Then one of the warriors raised a cell phone to his mouth and spoke into it. Except he wasn't speaking. He made a clattering clicking sound, like dry teeth on bone. Suddenly I understood what was going on. The skeletons had split up to look for us. Their skele these skeletons were now calling their brethren. Soon we'd have a full party on our hands. It's near. Grover moaned. It's here, I said. No, he insisted. The gift. The gift from the wild. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I was worried about his condition. He was in no shape to walk, much less fight. We'll have to go one on one, Thalia said. Four of them. Four of us. Maybe they'll ignore Grover that way. Agreed, said Zoe. The wild, Grover moaned. A warm wind blew through the canyon, rustling the trees, but I kept my eyes on the skeletons. I remember the general gloating over Annabeth's fate. I remember the way Luke had betrayed her. And I charged. The first skeleton fired. Time slowed down. I won't say I could see the bullet, but I could feel its path, the same way I felt water currents in the ocean. I deflected it off the edge of my blade and kept charging. The skeleton drew a baton, and I sliced off his arms at the elbows. Then I swung Riptide through his waist and cut him in half. His bones unknitted and clattered to the tarmac in a heap. Almost immediately, they began to move reassembling themselves. The second skeleton clattered his teeth at me and tried to fire, but I knocked his gun onto the snow. I thought I was doing pretty well until the other two skeletons shot me in the back. Percy, Thalia screamed. I landed face down in the street. Then I realised something. I wasn't dead. The impact of the bullets had been dull like a push from behind, but they hadn't hurt me. The Nemean lion's fur. My coat was bulletproof. 
Thalia charged the second skeleton. Zoe and Bianca started firing arrows at the third and fourth. Grover stood there and held his hands out to the trees, looking like he wanted to hug them. There was a crashing sound in the forest to our left, like a bulldozer. Maybe the skeleton's reinforcements were arriving. I got to my feet and ducked a police bat on. The skeleton I'd cut in half was already fully reformed, coming after me. There was no way to stop him. Zoe and Bianca fired at their heads point blank, but the arrows just whistled straight through their empty skulls. One lunged at Bianca and I thought she was a goner, but she whipped out her hunting knife and stabbed the warrior in the chest. The whole skeleton erupted into flames, leaving a little pile of ashes and a police badge. How did you do that? Zoe asked. I don't know, Bianca said nervously. Lucky shot? Well, do it again. Bianca tried, but the remaining three skeletons were wary of her now. They pressed us back, keeping us at baton's length. Plan? I said as we retreated. Nobody answered. The trees behind the skeletons were shivering. Branches were cracking. A gift, Grover muttered. And then, with a mighty roar, the largest pig I'd ever seen came crashing into the road. It was a wild boar, ten metres high, with a snotty pink snout and tusks the size of canoes. Its back bristled with brown hair, and its eyes were wild and angry. Reet! It squealed and raked the three skeletons aside with its tusks. The force was so great, they went flying over the trees and into the side of the mountain, where they smashed to pieces, thigh bones and arm bones twirling everywhere. Then the pig turned on us. Thalia raised her spear, but Grover yelled, Don't kill it! The boar grunted and pawed the ground, ready to charge. That's the Eremanthian boar, Zoe said, trying to stay calm. I don't think we can kill it. It's a gift, Grover said, a blessing from the wild. The boar said, Eat! and swung its tusk. Zoe and Bianca dived out of the way. I had to push Grover so he wouldn't get launched into the mountain on the Boar Tusk Express. Yeah, I feel blessed, I said. Scatter! We ran in different directions, and for a moment the boar was confused. It wants to kill us, Thalia said. Of course, Grover said. It's wild. So how is that a blessing? Bianca asked. It seemed a fair question to me, but the pig was offended and charged her. She was faster than I'd realised. She rolled out of the way of its hooves and came up behind the beast. It lashed out with its tusks and pulverised the Welcome to Cloudcroft sign. I racked my brain, trying to remember the myth of the boar. I was pretty sure Hercules had fought this thing once, but I couldn't remember how he'd beaten it. I had a vague memory of the boar ploughing down several Greek cities before Hercules managed to subdue it. I hoped Cloudcroft was insured against giant wild boar attacks. Keep moving, Zoe yelled. She and Bianca ran in opposite directions. Grover danced around the boar, playing his pipes while the boar snorted and tried to gouge him. But Thalia and I won the prize for bad luck. When the boar turned on us, Thalia made the mistake of raising Aegis in defence. The sight of the Medusa head made the boar squeal in outrage. Maybe it looked too much like one of his relatives. The boar charged us. We only managed to keep ahead of it because we ran uphill and we could dodge in and out of the trees while the boar had to plough through them. On the other side of the hill, I found an old stretch of train tracks, half buried in the snow. This way, I grabbed Thalia's arm and we ran along the rails while the boar roared behind us, slipping and sliding as it tried to navigate the steep hillside. Its hooves were just not made for this, thank the gods. Ahead of us, I saw a covered tunnel. Past that, an old trestle bridge spanning a gorge. I had a crazy idea. Follow me. Thalia slowed down. I didn't have time to ask why, but I pulled her along and she reluctantly followed. Behind us, a ten-ton pig, pig, pig tank was knocking down pine trees and crushing boulders under its hooves as it chased us. Thalia and I ran into the tunnel and came out on the other side. No, Thalia screamed. She turned as white as ice. We were at the edge of the bridge. Below, the mountain dropped away into a snow-filled gorge about twenty metres below. The boar was right behind us. Come on, I said. I'll, it'll hold your weight. It'll hold our weight, probably. I can't, Thalia yelled. Her eyes were wild with fear. The boar smashed into the covered tunnel, tearing through at full speed. Now, I yelled at Thalia. She looked down and swallowed. I swear she was turning green. I didn't have time to process why. The boar was charging through the tunnel straight towards us. Plan B. I tackled Thalia and sent us both sideways off the edge of the bridge, into the side of the mountain. We slid on Aegis like a snowboard, over rocks and mud and snow racing downhill. The boar was less fortunate. It couldn't turn that fast, so all ten tons of the monster charged out onto the tiny trestle, which buckled under its weight. The boar fell, three fell into the gorge with a mighty squeal and landed in a snowdrift with a huge poof. Thalia and I skidded to a stop. 
We were both breathing hard. I was cut up and bleeding. Thalia had pine needles in her hair. Next to us, the wild boar was squealing and struggling. All I could see was the bristly tip of its back. It was wedged completely in the snow, like styrofoam packing. It didn't seem to be hurt, but it wasn't going anywhere either. I looked at Thalia. You're afraid of heights. Now that we were safely down the mountain, her eyes had her usual angry look. Don't be stupid. That explains why you freaked out on Apollo's bus, why you didn't want to talk about it. She took a deep breath, and then she brushed the pine needles out of her hair. If you tell anyone, I swear. No, no, I said. That's cool. It's just the daughter of Zeus, the lord of the sky, afraid of heights. She was about to knock me into the snow when above us, Grover's voice called, Hello! Down here, I called. A few minutes later, Zoe, Bianca and Grover joined us. We stood watching the wild boar struggle in the snow. A blessing of the wild, Grover said, though he now looked agitated. I agree, Zoe said. We must use it. Hold up, Thalia said irritably. She still looked like she'd just lost a fight with a Christmas tree. Explain to me why you're so sure this pig is a blessing. Grover looked over, distracted. It's our ride west. Do you have any idea how fast this boar can travel? Fun, I said. Like uh, pig cowboys. Grover nodded. We need to get aboard. I wish. I wish I had more time to look around, but it's gone now. What's gone? Grover didn't seem to hear me. He walked over to the boar and jumped onto its back. Already the boar was starting to make some headway through the drift. Once it broke free, there'd be no stopping it. Grover took out his pipes. He started playing a snappy tune and tossed an apple in front of the boar. The apple floated and spun right above the boar's nose, and the boar went nuts, straining to get it. Automatic steering, Thalia murmured. Great. She trudged over and jumped on behind Grover, which still left plenty of room for the rest of us. Zoe and Bianca walked towards the boar. Wait a second, I said. Do you two know what Grover is talking about, this wild blessing? Of course, Zoe said. Did you not feel it in the wind? It was so strong. I never thought I would sense that presence again. What presence? She stared at me like I was an idiot. The Lord of the Wild, of course. Just for a moment, in the arrival of the boar. I felt the presence of Pan.